You see, we want to see in society. They don't even care. Because we have to do it. We can go to stop. We can get bothers. The monsters. We let them move. But now, all we have to do is make a project. Society. K-P-R Or P-K-R Kevin Rose, a good IRL friend who goes way back with me and my boys. We used to dye our hair and shave it into little mohawks, sometimes big mohawks. Go to the mall and just be little shits. Those are the days. We saw Usher at the mall once and yelled at him. We didn't yell at him in a, in a mean way, just an annoying way. Um, good times. Uh, so uh, I'm going to pause for just a second because this is the first time I'm recording in our uh, in, my, in their new studio, my new studio space here. So I'm going to pause and make sure it doesn't sound bad because I haven't treated this room yet uh, or have not uh, soundproofed the room, has treated the room. That's a little industry lingo. Uh, for getting stuff sounding good, uh, I'm putting soundproofing stuff on the walls, and I haven't done that in this room yet. Uh, it shouldn't affect the sound too much, but I can hear a little bit of a, an echo here, so um, let me uh, just check this real quick. Okay, don't think I completely got rid of the uh, the room sound there, but I think it improved just a little bit there. But, you know, I'll, I'll be uh, working on this room, getting everything set up. I'm very excited about it, getting the soundproofing done, and... Uh, yeah, so this is uh, my new studio, hitting you, hitting you from, hitting you in the ears from this spot for the first time here. And uh, I, uh, this episode's very late, so I'm gonna go ahead and record this, even though the sound is not up to my usual standards. Um, so yeah, what was I talking about? Uh, Ursher. We saw Ursher at the mall. Me and Kevin Rose and and Bo and Jim and. Max and all all my boys from back in the day, uh, and um, yeah, so that was so that's Kevin Rose is now a supporter. He's he sent me a message saying, "Hey, I've been listening to Breadsheet, and it's made me realize that I'm a lot further left than I thought I was, which is a good thing. I like to bring people to revelations such as that. Kevin is a great dude. Um, he's a drummer, fantastic drummer, and uh, Max and I keep saying we want to try starting a punk band with him. Um, maybe that's the band we can call these United Snakes. Kevin has become the fourth patron of the Haas Bossman Patreon, which I, of course, appreciate very, very much with every fiber of my being. Um, that's at patreon.com slash Haas underscore Bossman. And he's also recently joined Twitter. So uh, give him a follow at Nard underscore Lord. That's N-A-R-D underscore L-O-R-D. Thank you to Kevin. Uh, Sansi, Cedric, and Amanda for getting into the ground floor and supporting this podcast, my music, and my YouTube channel, uh, which has video essays and uh, other exclusive content to that channel, as well as uh, sometimes I'll, I'll clip interviews from this podcast, Breadsheet, with me, Haas Bossman. Breadsheet. This episode has been a long time a coming. I think it's actually been three weeks since I published the last episode. That was uh, my interview with Pansy Division's fantastical uh, bass bassist and uh, co-songwriter slash singer uh, Chris Freeman. And that interview was awesome. We've gotten a lot of awesome feedback on that. Um, also, since last we spake, I have fully moved down to this uh, town about three hours south of where I was living. My, my butter bean, my girlfriend, my partner has uh, started her new job, her first real life lawyering job. 
Um, and uh, yeah, things. I also um, finally published that uh, Money in Politics video that's at the Haas Bossman YouTube channel at bit.ly slash HaasTube. Also, www.haas.fun. You can find, uh, you know, all the different platforms this podcast is available on and uh, also links to all my social media and all that stuff. This episode of Bridgeheed is Ben Burgess again, the return. Uh, so let me just uh, get through this housekeeping stuff real quick and get to the juice. The juice of our esteemed guest, philosopher king and host of Give Them an Argument podcast, as well as Jacobin and other uh, magazine uh, publications, columnists, and just, you know, a luminary of the left, um, Ben Burgess. So, uh, now that these interviews are getting more specific and I'm having a wider variety of guests and the Breadsheet audience is growing, uh, I might should start taking uh, notes of caveats to give as I'm editing the interviews. Now, Ben Burgess is obviously much more of a smart man than I, uh, seeing he's finished his PhD and got a job, nay, multiple jobs after doing so, uh, into teaching with his PhD, in fact. And I quit my PhD program after only one semester, and I don't even have any jobs at the moment. But I like Doc Burgess quite a bit because he seems to gravitate toward a similar set of nuanced disagreements with other leftoids and lefties as I do. Uh, you know, there's some expression about when we agree on 99% of everything, that 1% becomes real important. Um, where does that quote come from? Let me see. Pause. Okay, I just looked and tried to find that quote, and I can't. So, uh, I don't know where that came from, but dibs. I came up with that. It's a Haas quote. TM. Now, uh, I don't think old Benny Bergs says anything terribly controversial in this interview, at least nothing that's going to surprise anyone who knows what my and his politics are. Um, I think some of the framing of stuff I didn't strictly like 100 percent agree with. Uh, but, you know, in spirit and in principle, I pretty much agreed with everything. He actually convinced me on a couple of things, which, you know, you'll hear in the interview the question of is Trump a fascist or not or was Trump a fascist? Yeah, I know. It sucks. Uh, it's it's really nice that Trump is out of office and we don't have to hear about him much. We do talk about Trump a bit in this interview and the uh, storming of the Capitol or the uh, the riot at the Capitol that happened on uh, January 6th and that kind of thing. Um, I'm going to try to steer away from talking about Trump too much as we, we move on and hopefully he's, you know, mostly out of our lives forever. Um, but I'm uh, bringing up this caveat now. Uh, to prep y'all sheetheads for next week's interview, which, yes, is coming next week because I'm actually finally done with the moving and whatnot, so my focus is reinvigorated. I'll get more into it in next week's intro, but Robbie Martin and I get into some territory that, uh, by the way, next week's episode is Robbie Martin, the great Robbie Martin of Media Roots Radio, and uh, we get into some territory that some people might not be super stoked about or simpatico with maybe. Uh, I'm not trying to like preemptively apologize or distance myself from Mr. Martin or the stuff we talk about or anything. Just giving a fair warning that we do get into a couple of areas of conspiratorial exploration. And I know, especially nowadays with QAnon and all that, people are, uh, you know, very wary of uh, conspiracy theorizing, which they very much should be. And um, I, I wouldn't say I 100% agree or like believe in, you know, unproven conspiracy theories. I think that there are some that are uh, very, you know, compelling. Um, but, you know, there absolutely have been conspiracies that have been carried out by the U.S. government and, you know, other large entities in the past. So um, I don't think it's smart to, I think it's, it's, Definitely smart to be very skeptical about conspiracy theories. Uh, obviously, the less evidence there is for them, the more skeptical you should be about them. Um, but I also think it would be equally not very smart to, uh, you know, throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. And just because you're skeptical about conspiracy theories in general, you know, make that to, to develop or to... Uh, to implement a policy of 100% not believing in conspiracy theories. A lot of them are goofy and dumb as hell. Um, but, you know, I, I try, I tend to try uh, not to 
talk about that stuff quite as much. I do think it's very, you know, fun and interesting. A lot of it is like historical fan fiction in a lot of ways. You know, I know it's maybe not the most credible, but, you know, it can be fun to think about. And, um, you know, I try to steer away from some of that and some of the maybe ones that I think there is some compelling, you know, just some merit to um, that are unproven which I always try to emphasize that, you know, I am, it is speculation in a lot of ways and hypothesizing as opposed to like theorizing really. Um, but, uh, you know, I try to steer away from that stuff so as not to alienate people. Um, but, uh, hopefully that little tease I just gave, uh, titillates you enough to get even more stoked for my chat with Robbie Martin. But today we're talking about some stuff that uh, might get mild pricklings from the lib adjacent left curious folks in my audience. Uh, Even some firm leftists might take some issue um, with uh, some of the stuff I talk about with Ben in this. Um, But hey, actually, let's uh, make this a brand new segment of Bridgesheet that we will call Haas Caveats. And I'm going to sing a little song and uh, maybe add some music to it. Or maybe we'll just do acapella this week. And then, here, I'll just see if I can turn this into something. If you need some love tonight, how's it going to make you feel all right? I don't want to get cancer from my brain thoughts. That's why I'm rubbing up. Okay, maybe I can do a little something with that. Um, let me see here. Outline here. Okay, so a quick first inaugural edition of Haas Caveat. So let's see if I can put some music behind that uh, for next week's episode. Uh, ben Burgess's article in The Nation is great, and I highly recommend you read it. Uh, it is linked in the description. Um, it is called... Prosecuting every participant in the Capitol riot is a mistake. Progressives should resist the temptation to call in the carceral state, even against people whose views we despise. By Ben Burgess, and uh, he has some good good reasoning for that, and uh, I, I tend to agree with him on that. And uh, also being very wary about the you know Patriot Act 2.0 that might be you know implemented as a result of that. And uh, yeah, I just don't think it's wise to overreact to things like that. So uh, yeah, I echoed a sentiment uh, very similar to Ben's uh, in that article in my MLK video. That's at bit.ly slash Haas2 or www.haas.fun. Go check that out and give me a subscribe and a like and a share and all that. Um, uh, I I really liked the way that one turned out. It was a uh, a video response to um, like a little 20 minute essay in response to a really horrible PragerU video starring Wilfwit. Um, but yeah, I, I, I echo the sentiment or I guess he echoed my sentiment, although I'm not saying he stole it from me, but, uh, you know, I mean, my brain does, you know, the, the, the left at large does tend to, um, steal things from my brain a lot. Uh, but, uh, yeah, this, this idea that the January six rioters seem more like poor fools than anything else to me. And I think it would be dumb for the rest of us to demonize them universally, whether that means prosecuting them legally or persecuting them socially. Not really sure if those words are the perfect choices there, prosecute and persecute, but I really wanted to use prosecuting and persecuting together like that. So, you know, here we are. This uh, interview I recorded like a month ago, so it was like pretty short after the uh, January 6th riots and uh, so at the Capitol. Uh, so, you know, maybe uh, Ben's views on this have maybe evolved as we've learned more about it and mine might have too. And uh, oh, also, I don't know why we... So here's another little caveat. Uh, I don't know why we didn't bring up Marilyn Manson when we when uh, Ben brought up Ozzy Osbourne. But I think maybe the news hadn't hit quite yet when we recorded this about Marilyn Manson's, you know, horrible, horrible sexual abuse Uh, allegations against him. Uh, But uh, I thought it was pretty interesting that Marilyn Manson, whom I've always regarded as a like phony edgelord, um, you know, never understood why people say, yeah, he's mostly just an attention seeker, but his band is fucking deadly, bro. Like, are you kidding me? His band is dog shit. It's like the simple plan or Avril Lavigne of like metal slash scary music. Super simplistic, unoriginal riffs that a person who knows literally nothing about how music works could write. Uh, also, I sorry, that's a little um, 
pretentious or condescending or arrogant, but I, I think any musicians out there who are the least bit familiar with Marilyn Manson's uh, band and uh, their playing ability would probably agree with me on that. Also, I remember people saying like, whoa, Marilyn Manson's actually super smart when he strung together like five coherent sentences about some lib shit in Bowling for Columbine. Um, you know, that movie, along with Michael Moore's book, Stupid White Men, was hugely influential on me. And while Moore has done and said many things that have annoyed me over the years, his politics have pretty much always been spot on, in my view. Um, but Marilyn Manson's a fucking loser. His whole Nazi-esque, contrarian, horror, vaguely evil, trans-othering, edgelord aesthetic was just that, an aesthetic and while the dumb, dumb normies of our stupid culture were preoccupied with uh, octopi. Hey, my octopus teacher, I did a, uh, a response to that. So octopi, octopus, uh, preoccupied. Um, but yeah, he, while the normies of our dumb culture were preoccupied with how quote unquote evil Marilyn Manson was, he was apparently just being a run of the mill piece of shit who abused the women in his life. Yeah, his, his music and persona are and always have been uninteresting in every way imaginable. Like, don't get me wrong. I love satanic shit and over the top gory horror stuff. Even some like purely edgelord contrarian bullshit can be entertaining to me. And I do appreciate on some level sometimes. But like Slayer and the Misfits sing about that stuff in a way that's like fun while still coming across as them taking themselves seriously. But it's also like you can't take the whole thing that seriously. And Manson's shit is just pathetic. So good riddance to him. Um... Wait, what the hell was I talking? Uh, oh, right. Uh, ben brought up Ozzy's whole, or in this interview, Ben uh, brings up Ozzy's whole biting the heads off chickens or bats or whatever he did as an act that comes across as like way more dangerous than it actually is. He's comparing it to like, you know, this new breed of Trumpian, Steve Bannon, Steve Miller ish Republican that's like basically just republicanism rebranded re uh with like more i think he says more sinister elements um and uh yeah so then that's you know the point is it's kind of a rebranding but um whoop, shit i think that uh marilyn manson represents a much better analogy to uh you know what what ben was analogizing it to in that talk uh you'll find out what he was talking about it's fairly early in the interview so um Right, he was talking about how Trump and Steve Bannon were basically just shitty Republicans in practice with uh, far more sinister branding than, say, like George W. Bush or Mitt Romney or Mitch McConnell or whomever or whoever. And Manson has this like terrifying edifice, but it was just hiding that he was just another turd man taking advantage of his position of power to abuse women. So, you know, mm -hmm. him. And, uh, you know, just as much of a loser as I always thought he was. So, uh, okay, next thing I'll caveat. I bring up some stuff my Butterbean said about someone she knew who worked with the EPA. And uh, she had relayed an anecdote to me about how, like, whole floors of the Atlanta EPA office had closed down. And I really just brought that up in my talk with Ben here today because it struck me that I really hadn't heard much about specific impacts Trump's deregulation and defunding of uh of you know government agencies and programs had had um you know if i were a better talker guy i would have pushed back on ben just a tad in this part of the conversation as he uh frames the trump administration as being the same as say mitt romney would have been in practice and uh, i slightly disagree with that i don't think that's a bad take or anything uh, i do think there is a little nuance i think there would have been some differences that are you know consequential like differences in degree between a trump and romney administration trump basically got nothing done that he promised to do except tax breaks for the rich which was part of his populist platform for some reason which is obviously standard republican policy poo uh, but i also think that there's something to be said about the capacity for restraint most other humans and republicans even uh, would have in contrast to trump um, I think like, you know, Mitt Romney would be worried about his uh, his reputation and coming off as, you know, he would be worried about his deregulation actually like causing huge problems, which I don't think that the Trump administration was even aware of or, you know, let alone 
cared about or, or knew about it all. So I think um, Romney and, and, you know, you think Bush and neocons and just pretty much just about anybody else would just have been more cautious about it. Um, you know, not for any good reasons, probably, but, you know, maybe for some reasons. OK, so uh, that's uh, like I said, I'm not I'm not trying to distance myself from uh, the, you know, what Ben said in the interview, because I largely agree with him. I just think that, uh, you know, there was if I had been a little bit more on my toes or thinking on my toes a little better during the interview, I would have brought that point up that I think there is, you know, a difference in degree between Trump and standard deregulating Republicans. And I do think that, you know, a lot of the bad shit that Trump did was like not really policy stuff. You know, there was, you know, the appointing all those right wing judges uh, and, you know, as well as three Supreme Court justices. Uh, wait, was it three or two? Ginsburg, Kavanaugh, or I mean, he, did, he put in Kavanaugh and uh, Amy Covid Barrett. Um, yeah, I think it was just them two. I'm gonna feel dumb if I missed one, but oh yeah, I forgot about Gorsuch. I actually still can't believe how incredibly unlucky we were that the worst president ever got to appoint three Supreme Court justices. Was he the worst president ever? I don't know. Definitely the worst human being, as in just bad in every way imaginable, represents every negative quality a person can have, but in a way, that turned out to be kind of a sort of good thing. Because he was so incompetent and selfish, he wasn't able to do nearly as much damage as it might have. What am I doing? This is way too long for the robot voice, and this episode is super duper late already. So, what was I talking about? Man, Trump sucks. Uh... And uh, I think that, yeah, a lot of the damage that Trump did was like, you know, breaking norms. Uh, I often say, like, I think pretty much the only thing about Trump that I like is in general is that he broke with some norms about like just what, you know, that I think he expanded what people think is possible in a general way, but obviously in mostly bad ways. Um, but, you know, maybe we can redirect that in the future. But yeah, I think that uh, a lot of the damage that Trump did wasn't necessarily on policy stuff. But like, I think that uh, in the future now that seeing what Trump was able to get away with, uh, both in a like norm breaking sense and just like the amount of deregulation and, you know, just like sloppy, just, you know, diarrhea spraying deregulation he was uh, able to get away with, I think it's going to make future Republicans uh, bolder about doing shitty stuff like that. All right. Also to expound a hair upon the whole big tech censorship conversation we touch on uh, toward the end of the podcast interview here. Um, of all plausible options, I would say that nationalization or at the very least some trust busting is in order for these like giant companies that control our de facto public forums, whether it's Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, or something yet to take hold. This whole conversation is kind of weird, though, because obviously the right wing dum dums who cry censorship when YouTube kicks them off for directing their subscribers to harass a gay dude or platforming a neo Nazi or whatever, that, you know, these things infringe upon their First Amendment rights. That's obviously untrue. Uh, these are private companies, so the First Amendment doesn't apply. And as I touch on in this conversation, my my smug leftist maneuver is to say, aha, so you think we should nationalize YouTube? Guess you should join up with us commies then. Uh, but as my lawyer girlfriend pointed out to me, that solution also has its drawbacks, namely that if Facebook were a government agency, all your shit posts and nitpicks would be... Um, nip pics as in pictures of your nipples would be a uh, fair game in your sedition trial somewhere down the road so basically we have to be vigilant about government and corporate power getting out of hand and i'd say we're pretty awful at being vigilant about both of those things so i don't know maybe i can kobayashi maru this thing and uh i'll just say that if there's ever been a time for us to use our imaginations to come up with a novel category, something that isn't a private or publicly traded corporation, a government agency, a public utility, or even a traditional worker co-op or whatever, I think now might be that time. Like, you know, we shouldn't limit ourselves to thinking like, well, what should we do with Facebook? Just, you know, one of the like five things we can think of to do that just because they it's been done in the past or thought of before. Um, you know, social media and the internet in general present such unprecedented possibilities. Maybe it doesn't make sense to apply 200 plus year old logic to it. I know that's pretty vague, but you know, I'm just one brain here and a shoddy one at that. So somebody take whatever I just said in a positive direction, please. 
Um, and then also I think that it's just kind of a weak take when people say like, oh, well, like uh, when people cry that, you know, YouTube is or Facebook or whatever is infringing on their First Amendment rights, you know, usually conservatives and, you know, say, well, the First Amendment does not apply to private corporations, which is true, of course. I mean, duh. But also, like, I don't think it's a great it, it, even though it is a true, a correct argument, it's not really a great argument like Uh, In the big picture, I think, because, you know, the reason that we have a First Amendment is because we think that the First Amendment is good. And, you know, it doesn't apply to those giant corporations. But, you know, I think that uh, it would be good if we could apply the First Amendment and other protections that we have to those giant corporations. Um, Or actually, no. What I think is that they those giant corporations shouldn't exist so it shouldn't matter and like you know that's kind of one of the big giant drawbacks of having these big giant uh corporate entities is that and especially when they have so much control over the flow of information and whatnot is that you know we don't have mechanisms for holding them accountable like we do you know government agencies and whatnot so uh yeah okie doke all right um i've uh i've gabbed uh, flap my gums for long enough here. So, um, all right. Ben Burgess is a philosopher King whom you can follow on Twitter at B E N B U R G I S. Uh, his podcast is give them an argument. He has a great book by that same name. Uh, the Twitter account for that show is at G T A A underscore show. Uh, and it can be found at youtube.com slash Ben Burgess G T A A. That's Ben B U R G I S G T A A, no underscore in that. And uh, his Patreon is patreon.com slash Ben Burgess, uh, no underscore in that either, unlike my Patreon, which is patreon.com slash Haas underscore Bossman. I'm also on Twitter, Instagram, and Twitch at Haas underscore Bossman. Um, oh, I did a, a live stream earlier today on, on the Twitch, played for about like 15, 20 minutes, played like three or four songs on there, and got a new follower while I was doing that. So now I think I'm up to like five or six followers on Twitch. So maybe if I do it every day for a year, I'll uh, get a follower every day, and at the end, I'll have, you know, what, like five, six hundred followers? followers um so uh yeah there's a uh, facebook and tumblr page too but you'll just have to find those so bit.ly slash hostube that's my uh, youtube channel or just go to www.host.fun for all your host needs and now since he did not get his original theme when he first graced me and y'all with his benevolent prevalence prevalence benevolence presence benevolent presence here is mr ben burgess's original theme which i'm calling uh poopy boop no um i do have a song called poopy boopies which i'm sitting on waiting for the right moment to release but ben burgess's song is called philosopher king shit because he is a philosopher king and he is king shit of fuck mountain hey future Haas here popping in for just a sec once again spent way too much time on the song But I figured, you know, Ben Burgess, he's been a friend of the show since the very beginning. So put lots of love into his song. Not that not that I don't put love into every song, but all right. Anyway, I'm uh, I'm just popping in here to say two things. Uh, One, sorry, this episode is so very, very late. I tried many things and uh, many new things, I should say. And my computer seems to be on its last leg i keep getting this system overload message i guess because i'm using like too many tracks and plugins and stuff but man my my brain is really galaxy and hard lately and uh i just there's no limit to my i told you there'd be a creative tsunami when we moved into this new place still getting set up in this uh, studio slash office space here i'm um, gonna be filming some stuff soon but anyway so i need to start thinking about how i'm gonna get a thousand dollars ish or a thousand ish dollars for a new computer that can handle my creative output and my galaxy brain um you know if you could just uh, venmo me like eight hundred dollars at Daryl grishaw on venmo uh d-e-r-l-e-g-r-i-s-h-a-w anonymously or you know whatever you can paypal me too just send me a message um i'm at hoss underscore bossman um and i'll be able to do this stuff much faster um and uh, maybe I could do a good a GoFundMe for, for eight hundred dollars to get a new Mac Mini, so that I can, uh, you know, not have my have to restart my computer all the time when I'm working on this stuff and having it 
garage band crash and stuff in any case i think next week's episode song uh that's robbie martin's theme song will not take nearly as long for reasons i may later reveal but i think finding clips of him is going to be easier and uh the other thing i wanted to say is that i decided to include clips of the late great michael brooks in ben burgess's theme song as i i know they were good friends and Michael Brooks died right around when I started this show, so although Breadsheet is way smaller and not nearly as high quality as Michael Brooks' show was, I feel that a bit of his spirit ventured my way to inspire me to try and make the show as interesting and fun and inviting as possible, Uh, you know, to really put in the work, um, you know, I can't be as intellectually rigorous as he is capable of being, but, or was capable of being, sadly. But, uh, you know, he did inspire me to really put in the work and play on my own weird strengths and try and make something unique, something that only I could make that contributes to the leftist project of, you know, making everybody have better lives and, uh, you know, doing it in concrete and abstract ways. Obviously, more abstract than anything at this moment, but hopefully I'll do more concrete stuff soon. So I also feel gratified to be able to double Ben's theme as a little tribute to Michael Brooks. I hope it's not in like poor taste or anything. I don't, I don't think it is. Michael Brooks, you know, he had a sense of humor about himself and all that. So I think it'll, I think it'll be just fine. It's, I try to make it just kind of sweet and cute. Um, and Michael Brooks just has so many clippable lines. Like I just, I really made this a lot more of a process than I needed to. I revisited several of Ben's appearances on the Michael Brooks show to get these clips, and I'd almost forgotten how everything out of that guy's mouth was either hilarious, brilliant, or just endearing as hell. So no one will ever fill his shoes. I should really make a dedicated tribute to him and do a segment in an episode where I really talk about how Michael Brooks inspired me. Um, when I first heard him on Tangentially Speaking, actually, uh, he was really the first person who I was like, oh, there is like a leftist, you know, treasure trove of content, of leftist content online that uh, I have been missing out on. And, uh, you know, ultimately got me into making Breadsheet. Uh, okay, so now that I've said all that, here's Ben Burgess's theme song featuring the late, great Michael Brooks, followed by my chat with Ben Burgess. I love y'all, and I'll see you at the end. Uh, all right, love you guys. Enjoy. I'll be back at the end to sign off and tell you what to do with the rest of your life. Are you intentionally not being enthusiastic about your songs? a fucking libertarian and I'll, I'll deplatform you in a second. Ben Burgess. Thank you for the debunk, my friends. Thank you for all you do. All right, thanks, Michael. Howdy. Howdy. How's it going, Mr. Burgess or Professor Dr. Burgess? <laughs> you know, even on syllabi, I say just call me Ben. Okay. All right, Ben. Um, so uh, how are how are things going out in uh, Michigan? Oh, it's all right. Snowy. Cool. How, many, how much snow did y'all get? Uh, I don't know exactly, but I've been like pretty much every time we have to leave to um you know to go uh you know see my parents or to you know just go do a curbside pickup from walmart like it's always an issue it's like okay shit do i need to use the snow blower today well that's i mean i always wanted to live someplace where it snows you know kind of regularly having grown up in the you know southeast i'm also very like 
uh, warm natured. I, I hate the heat despite having grown up in the South. Like I have never gotten used to these like Southern summers. Yeah. My, my wife is from Texas and she's the same way. I, I mean, I'd actually kind of like to live someplace warm, but you know, she likes having like seasons and cold and it not getting too hot in the summer and all that stuff. So yeah. Thank you for uh, joining me again on yeah. Breadsheet. Um, you were like the second guest I think I ever had, and this is going to be, I think you're gonna this is gonna be like the 20th or 21st episode okay nice you know so congratulations on being the uh set the first repeat uh breadsheet guest excellent so now that i've done kind of like the feature style interview with you kind of yeah. asking about your background and stuff you can yep. get like a little bit more specific talking about some things i oh i did want to tell you one thing that uh since last we spake uh, i've started doing this uh gimmick in which i make an original theme song for each guest oh yeah so you will be introduced by an original theme song. Do you have any, you know, I didn't do that for you because that was like early on. Um, do you have any like a genre, tone, mood, feel suggestions, or do you want to be surprised? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I'm a um, generally a classic rock or stone or metal kind of guy, but you know, like, you know, whatever's in your heart. Okay, cool. I think I can, I haven't done a, uh, you know, a, a, a nice clean rock style parody type thing in a while so maybe i'll uh maybe i'll go in that direction but um let's see okay so yeah i read the uh the piece that you sent me that was uh did you say that was your most recent piece uh, in the the nation yeah that was um, that came out on friday okay um i gotta say i'll try not to front load too much but um instead of like starting with some questions i'll just kind of like give you my take on the topic sure. and um you know see what you think about my take and you know see where we're at there so um the article is called prosecuting every participant in the capital riot is a mistake subtitle uh progressive should resist the temptation to call in the carceral state even against people whose views we despise which you know even before looking at the article just seeing the title i generally like agree pretty broadly with that sentiment yeah. um you know, it seems like, you know, that uh, my freedom of speech or f freedom to swing my fist ends where the next man's face begins type thinking, um, you know, it's I always kind of thought of that as something that especially coming up in the Bush era, that that was like a concept that people on the left were better at grasping that like with uh. something like the Patriot Act, like why would we have these draconian, you know, laws that infringe on our civil liberties to defend the country that the thing we're supposed to like about it are the civil liberties that we have in theory anyway right, right? and i guess so like people listening uh, don't misconstrue what your position in the article is um yeah. i you know highly recommend uh people read it I'll, I'll link it in the description of this episode and stuff um and uh, uh I, there was actually just like one short paragraph that i think kind of sums up the caveats with this topic you know it's that can be kind of required sure. and um and uh, a big element of your main thesis uh that some of the protesters who entered the capitol literally engaged in violence they shouldn't be let off the hook right uh, nor should lawmakers uh, who took an oath to defend the Constitution. Um, but what, what about the hundreds who just wandered around taking selfies or chanting slogans? Um, would you say that kind of like sums up your your take on the thesis of your article there? Yeah, no, that's that's right. So and, and I should say too, you know, because it, it might not necessarily be obvious what I'm reacting to because um, after all, it's it's not clear that every single person who was there will even necessarily be prosecuted uh, yet. Um, and so, you know, it, it, it might just seem like a, a slightly random, you know, thing to, uh, uh, to be talking about. But what I'm responding to are a lot of arguments that have been out there from, uh, I would say... Uh, without getting too like nitpicky about taxonomy here, people from like left liberals or you know or um, or people you know like that, somewhat to the left of that, people who think themselves as progressives. Uh, so like uh, Ellie Mistal uh, is a uh, constitutional scholar, some of whose stuff I really like, uh, who had a previous article in the Nation uh, where where he was very clear, you know, he was he was. Uh, he was very aggressively advocating that every single person there be not just even be prosecuted, you know, cause you could prosecute everybody for, you know, like 
relatively minor offenses, but like really have the, have the book thrown at them. Uh, and I don't want to single out Mistel too much. Plenty of people made this argument. Uh, Matt Iglesias, you know, like seemed to be suggesting this in the piece that he wrote for his Substack, like on the sixth, uh, Congressman Ted Lieu, you know, tweeted, you know, along very similar lines to uh, Mistel's article. And so the, like, the most extreme version of the view, which both Mistal and Lou advocated, is that everybody who was there should actually be prosecuted under the uh, felony murder statute that says that if you have uh, basically, if you've aided in, you know, the commission of a crime and somebody is killed in some way, you know, that's in some way a result of, of the crime, even if you didn't do it and you might have not even known about it. Then you can be uh, then you can be prosecuted for it. Uh, so there, are, you know, this is the kind of thing that's been used against people. Like, you know, if there's like a robbery and you're just the lookout, you know, but the the robber, you know, like somebody kind of stumbled on them and the robber shot them, you know, you can be prosecuted for felony murder. Uh, and I think that one thing to say about that is that that's. Um, the kind of thing that like, I, I think we shouldn't even want to exist, you know, want, want laws like that to exist. I mean, that's exactly the kind of thing that, that puts America's incarceration rate through the roof is, is us having things like felony murder laws, you know, that these, these kinds of really extreme statues that, uh, that, that really inflate the amount of time that people spend in prison for a whole variety of things. Uh, but the other thing is that I think that in um, in saying that we really need to have, you know, mass arrests and not again for like the people like you said in those in that uh, quote from the article, uh, don't how didn't engage in violence, don't necessarily seem to have you know intended to engage in violence. Um, and I'm sure there are going to be gray area cases, you know, where, you know, where it's like a little hard to suss out what any individual's intention were, but in terms of people who clearly didn't, uh, intend violence, I think to my mind, there's a question about whether you even like go nuts trying to like track them down to, to prosecute them even in a minimal way. Uh, and certainly I don't like the idea of, of coming up with these extreme draconian legal theories uh, to, uh, to justify this, some of which, and I know people say, oh, you know, they got off easy. If it had been a predominantly black crowd, you know, wouldn't have gone the same way. And I'm sure a lot of that's true. Uh, I, I don't really doubt it. But, uh, but two points I'd make. One is that I don't think that when we see discrepancies like this, I don't think that our instinct should be to resolve that discrepancy in favor of a harsher carceral approach all around. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I mean, in, in fact, uh, that was one of Joe Biden's, you know, rationalizations at one point for his vote for the crime bill is that uh, uh, when judges had more discretion about sentences, you know, there were big racial disparities and, and it's just so crazy. It's like, okay, that's why we need mandatory minimums. You know, it's like, no, that's why you should have mandatory maximums. If anything you sure. know, <laughs> is to resolve it in that direction. And the other thing I'd, I'd say without taking up too much more time on this is that it's not uh some of this stuff is not even a double standard because some of this stuff that some of these people are suggesting would actually be like an escalation compared to what has been done uh, to crack down on left-wing protests, predominantly black protests, etc. cetera. So uh, if, if you look, I mean, as terrible and repressive and violent as a lot of the things that police did last summer uh, were, uh, some of these things would be novel escalations like this felony murder suggestion, because it seems to me that uh, you could use that theory to justify um, throwing the book at every single person who occupied the Capitol Hill area in Seattle, because there were, uh, you know, there were people who were shot, you know, by, by participants of that. Uh, and everybody there, you know, was, engaged in a you know illegal occupation of a bit of you know street at least you know that they uh so that's obviously i wouldn't want that to happen but because i wouldn't want that to happen i don't really want to set this precedent and and you know i guess the last part of the calculation here is just that i think that the question is 
much like what you brought up earlier about the aftermath of 9-11, you know, the question is really what's a greater threat, you know, because obviously like the people who stormed the Capitol, I mean, some of these people were outright fascists, you know, they, 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 a lot of them were part of QAnon, which is, is a, you know, basically a cult, but is extremely dangerous. Uh, you know, uh, this is all very bad news, right? Uh, but, you know, so was Al-Qaeda, right? I mean, Al-Qaeda is a uh, extreme right-wing organization that hates gay people and, you know, wants, you know, and, and, and hates women's rights, etc. Uh, but I think at least those of us on the anti-war left correctly recognized that Al-Qaeda was much less of a danger to the democratic rights and freedoms of Americans than an expanded security state is. And I would say the same thing about, like, a crowd of 800 lunatics uh, at the uh, at the Capitol um, versus um, the, these sorts of expansions in the in the power of the uh, the carceral state, which is already out of control. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it uh, it's when I, I was at a Black Lives Matter protest uh, this past summer and uh a ki- I can say he's a kid, you know, he was a younger, maybe college age guy came up to me trying to get me to sign a petition that uh, any cop who kills an unarmed person should get the death penalty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know, it kind of seems like uh, that sort of defeats the purpose of, you know, kind of like what I said earlier that like, you know, at what point have we, compromised so much for our security that it's like well what are we even like defending or you know at this point yeah right like uh i mean i actually saw an article along the lines of the ones i've been talking about saying uh uh the person said i'm a prison abolitionist but i want to see everybody who's at the capitol you know thrown in prison to which i would say that you're not a prison abolitionist you know that like if uh i mean if you're not just saying you want it like you derive some like emotional satisfaction from it which whatever fair enough right you know but like you're saying that you would actually advocate it then no you're not right like and i mean with prisons i actually wouldn't go as far as total abolitionism i think we probably do need some form of um you know organized voluntary you know involuntary confinement you know for people who genuinely pose a violent threat to the rest of society i think it should be extremely minimalistic and focused on rehabilitation you know but um and you know i think that there should probably be like two percent as many people in prison as there are in you know modern america uh but whatever you think about that issue like even if you have that stance it's i think it's it's weird and inconsistent you know to want to sort of dredge up these extremely harsh legal theories that are even an escalation of what the state has done recently and sure and certainly like i mean i'm absolutely a, an abolitionist about the death penalty and if you are going to have that position then that really means nobody gets executed right like if, if if you don't if you think some people shouldn't be should be executed then you're not a death penalty abolitionist you're you're maybe somebody you know maybe you want fewer people to be executed or something but you know but i mean you you basically support the death penalty um and since i don't right i don't want any i don't want anybody to be executed you know i, I think that in any society that has um uh, i mean see above re how horrifying and violent and oppressive the American system, you know, prison system is like all the ways that system can be criticized. One thing that we are really good at is keeping people in prison. You know, we've got that down pat, uh, you know, it's not necessarily something to brag about, but I mean, that, that, that is something that American society has, has, has mastered, you know, it's, it's very rare that anybody successfully escaped from prison for, uh certainly for you know for serious crimes so uh so i think that yeah in any society where um where we can isolate people who who might pose a violent threat to others without killing them then it's it's morally abhorrent to kill them and yeah that does unfortunately apply also to uh that does uh, that does apply even to you know killer cops and you know and, and other people we might find equally odious and and i guess also i mean i think that it's kind of like there's something even a little defeatist about that. Like the only way to distance, to provide, you know, it's, it's like, is the issue that individual cops are terrible people, which don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that lots of them aren't 
right? Sure. But is the issue that individual cops are terrible people or is the issue with like the structure of policing in American society as it exists right now? Uh, because if there are solutions on that more structural level, then, you know, just, I don't know. I mean, do we have to just accept that some, you know, some cops will illegitimately kill people and, and the only, you know, our only real solution is to try to deter that by, by executing them, which, uh, which we know doesn't work anyway. Cause, cause we know that we can compare states that have the death penalty and states that don't have the death penalty and states that have the death penalty don't have lower murder rates. So, I mean, the whole, I mean, whatever. I, I know that was like way too much of a rant for a casual example that you mentioned in passing. Oh, no, no. You know, but that's, you know, that's, that's, that seems like, I, I guess that and one of the reasons that example bothers me so much too, is I could totally see like some event like that. Everybody just signing that without a second thought, you know, cause it's like, Oh yeah, no, right. You know, like it, it sounds like, it sounds like something that you'd support just, you know, you want to like really express how deeply you, you know, you're opposed to police violence. And that just sounds like a natural way of expressing it. But then like, you know, you think about it for, for two minutes and, and the only way to justify the position is by accepting something that we shouldn't accept, you know, which is that the death penalty is a legitimate institution and it really deters crime and all that stuff. Sure. Yeah. It's uh, the type of thing that is very uh, difficult to communicate. And it's like, since I've been doing some of these, like, you know, trying to do debunking videos, which oh. like, you know, Prager you and these like right wings. So it seems like one of the main things that they do is like a whole lot of straw manning. Mm. And so, you know, if we're saying the law should be applied consistently, right. but I don't want the law to be applied in that way at all. It's like immediately out of the gate, you have this, like, you're like losing half the people that you're trying to communicate to almost. Cause it's like, I don't know. I, you know, communicating nuance is obviously more difficult than communicating like black and white ideas. Um, I don't know. Yeah, like, no, it, it is for sure. Right. You know, but I mean, I, and although I, I think that we shouldn't lose the, uh, the nuance when it's important, I think we should just need, need to think about how to express it in rhetorically punchy ways, you know, and that's, that's really the, that's really the issue, you know, that like, we don't, um, I don't know, you know, equal, uh, you know, uh, equal floors, not equal ceiling, something like that, you know, that like we have, mm -hmm. you know, that we, you know, like, cause it's, it's, I, th I think it's a pretty straightforward intuitive idea in some ways, like, look, uh, you know, we want a vastly more economically equal society, but obviously what we mean by that is not that we want everybody to be living in poverty. Sure. Yeah. Which is, you know, another thing that like, they'll kind of, you know, straw man, you know, Jordan Peterson kind of uh, presents the like leftist economic ideas or, you know, somebody like that as if that is what they want. Like, you know, we want to make everybody equal by, you know, chopping everyone's hands off or, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I mean, another thing that's like kind of uh, related to, you know, this article and some of the ideas that you touch on, um, I, I've heard you say that you don't consider Trump a fascist. Mm, and, yeah. you know, as I've heard a lot of people I, whose opinions I respect uh, say that. And, you know, I call him a fascist, but, yeah. you know, I think it requires some caveats. And at that point, it's like, well, how useful is the term if you have to, like, give a, a definition of it every time you say it? Um, but, you know, he's pretty lame as fascists go. Uh, but still, and I would say it kind of seems like he's like, accidentally a fascist just a lot of the things that he you know that he ticks a lot of the boxes of you know the whole um, umberto echo 14 points of uh, yeah. fascism or whatever um but uh so why why would you say that and then i have another sort of terminological question but uh why sure. would you say that trump doesn't count as a fascist yeah right so i, I mean i think that as you kind of indicated there the question the way you asked the question i think it's it's a really ambiguous question you know because um you know i mean is the question even is trump personally a fascist and then what does that mean right you know do, does does he uh you know in his private heart does he does he long for the end of democracy and and uh it's replaced with fascism yeah maybe uh, I mean, I think in that sense, you know, he might not be unique, you know, supposedly when Richard Nixon visited China 
uh, he told aides that uh, you know he really admired Mao's ability to run such a vast country with, you know, with 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 so few people in in his decision making circle. You know, <laughs> yeah, so I think that that sort of that sort of um, you know, man, wouldn't this be easier if we just had authoritarianism? Impulse, you know, might be common for uh, certainly a, a certain kind of 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 gross right wing, you know, uh, American president. Um, and, you know, I, I certainly don't think, look, I mean, like Matt Taibbi has really good line, uh, you know, about the question, the idea when people were suggesting at one point, you know, between the uh, election and Biden's inauguration that Trump might do a military coup. And um, and Taibbi's line was that Trump wouldn't morally object to doing a military coup, certainly. Uh, but, you know, five minutes into planning it out with his generals, he would lose interest and wander off to watch television and you know that that kind of has the ring of truth to to it. So I, I think, um, you know, the I think the more interesting question is not like, does Trump have some sort of like personal affinity for for fascism? I mean, I certainly don't think that he has. Like, I, I certainly think that if you if you put him in a situation where there was a mass fascist movement, like you know, the brown shirts or the black shirts, or whatever. And, uh, and you said, Hey, Trump, do you want to be at the head of it? And then they'll make you the dictator. Uh, would he say, yeah, I'm sure he would. Right. Like, you know, I mean, like, a, like if nothing else, uh, you know, I, I think he's completely incapable of, of any sort of empathy for, I think almost maybe literally any other human being. Right. So he certainly wouldn't object on those grounds. And, um, and you know he's all about self-aggrandizement, so yeah, he probably probably would do it. Um, but if if what we're talking about is not kind of an inventory of Donald Trump's diseased soul, but um, but the question of his actual political program uh, or uh, what what sort of threat he did or didn't pose to certain kinds of institutions, or you know, or even like even how he talked about politics, really, uh, then I think that I don't think he's a fascist. And I don't, I guess I'd push back a little bit against emphasizing like the Umberto Eco stuff, not because Eco's not like a, a smart and thoughtful guy who, you know, clearly knows, you know, the, uh, you know, the rhetoric and ideology of fascism very intimately, you know, from, from his experiences. Um, but because, I don't find the methodology useful. And here's what I mean by that. I think that, um, that if all you're doing is kind of seeing like, okay, what are the points of similarity or echo between, uh, no pun intended, between um, the rhetoric of Trump and Trumpists and the rhetoric of classical European fascists, you know, then um, are there going to be things they have in common? Yeah, there are. Uh, there are also going to be things that they have very significantly not in common, by the way, uh, which are not trivial points at all. Uh, I mean, I, I, like on January 6th, all of those people, you know, they were deluded. And again, some of them are, you know, whatever, like they, I think there is no bottom to how bad the views of some of them were at least, you know, but, uh, but at best, right. You know, the, the least bad people on the six, you know, were, uh, had, had, beliefs that were totally disconnected from reality but in their minds they were defending democracy against people who'd stolen an election uh which is a really significant disanalogy because uh the people who marched on rome you know in, in the Mussolini case or the people who were part of you know hitler's you know street fighting you know organization you know as he was leading up to really taking power or the people who like one of the most historically literate ways of analogizing that to uh, classical fascism was people brought up like the fascist attacks on the French parliament in 1934, uh, you know, but like the people who were doing that attack in 1934 were actually part of what they called anti-parliamentary leagues. They were like explicitly anti-democracy, uh, whereas the people on the sixth thought in a delusional way that they were defending democracy. Uh, and another really important point of disconnect, and I think really profoundly important point of disconnect, is that uh, fascism, if it's about anything, is about constant warfare. Uh, that's, I mean, that, I, I think that's really the uh, the heart of the beast. You know, I, I think that, you know, there is no such thing as non-militaristic uh, fascism. Uh, and 
really, if anything, Trump glorified war and warfare in his rhetoric less than normal American presidents do. So that's, that's like a really interesting point of disconnection. But my broader problem with with that meth is, you know, so those are those are sort of points where I think that even on its own terms, the case isn't totally convincing. But I think my broader problem with it is with the methodology, is with saying, uh, oh, what you should look at to determine whether X is a fascist or is leading a fascist movement or poses a fascist threat to democracy, which I think are maybe not all the same question, but whatever, uh, that like that what you should look at is how much their rhetoric might echo the rhetoric of fascist, classical European fascism. And I think that's just a bad methodology for a couple of reasons. One reason is that you're going to get way, way, way too many false positives that way uh, because I think every conservative or right-wing movement is going to have some echoes of the rhetoric of classical European fascism because classical European fascism wasn't sui generis. It wasn't like just something that was like a, you know, came out of nowhere and 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 was totally unique. It was uh, it was drawing on pre-existing wells of reactionary thought, and so uh, so yeah, of course the uh, the rhetoric of fascism is going to have similarities to later right-wing movements that come after classical European fascism. It's also going to have tons of similarities to earlier right-wing movements that came before classical European fascism. Uh, and, and I think that's just not going to be a very interesting way of asking the question, uh, you know, that, you know, you're just going to get too many. And even some of those echo points, like, I mean, I think we don't even have to just restrict ourselves to what we would, you know, would usually be thought of as right wing movements. I mean, you could even find echoes between class, the themes of classical European fascism and like the rhetoric of like the Clinton administration, you know, when it was, uh, you know, there's a lot of national greatness talk there. There was a lot of talk about family, you know, like that's uh, so I, I, I think, again, I, I just don't find that super interested. I, I think the more interesting question, you know, the same way that Karl Marx said that the, um, you know, when it comes to the aspirations of the radical left, that, you know, the, you uh, know, the point isn't just to interpret the world, it's to change it, right? Well, the, you know, I think I think we should be asking the same question about the people we don't like, right? You know, like in what direction are they actually changing the world or at least posing a significant threat of changing the world? And I don't think that Trump ever represented a fascist threat to the core institutions of what we generously call American democracy. Uh, that it's... And I don't think I don't think he ever had those aspirations, and I certainly don't think he was ever in any sort of position to uh, uh, to do that. I, I think that in if anything, I think he was an unusually weak president institutionally. Uh, that you know he was he was much more undermined from within the executive branch, had much more less cooperation, you know, various levels, you know, of government than than most presidents do. And I think he was able to leave less of a stamp on American institutions than, uh, than, than most presidents do. Uh, and, and I don't think, and it's also significant if you look at the way that, that those classical European fascist regimes arose, that they didn't really arise. Like the, the way that they arose was that you'd have something like the black shirts in Italy or the brown shirts in Germany uh, as this kind of gangsterish street fighting force that uh, was then able to, um, to uh to take power in some way uh in like like in germany they they had they, they invoked this emergency powers clause you know in the constitution uh and then use that power to uh smash all uh you know trade unions and opposition political parties and uh and and sort of fuse those gangsterish street fighting forces with the existing machinery of the state and I mean, just to, you know, belabor the obvious a little bit, none of that happened here, right? You know, none of it came close to happening. None of it was ever in any danger of happening, I think. And I'm saying all this as somebody who, to, to be clear, I mean, I, you know, I mean, I live in a swing state. I held my nose and voted for Biden. Uh, you know, I, I, I think Trump was bad and dangerous, but I think that the respects in which he was bad and dangerous, I don't think are usefully eliminated by these analogies to fascism. I think the respects in which he was bad and dangerous, by and large, honestly, were mostly the respects in which like Mitt Romney would have been dangerous if uh, if, if he'd become president. Um, I mean, I think the thing that's probably most unique to Trump, I mean, this is a little unknowable since 
you know, like, like it's, it's hard to be confident about the counterfactuals, but the respect in which he was probably most unique uh, in which he was probably posed a different kind of danger than Mitt Romney or John McCain had would have if they'd won their elections is actually kind of in the opposite direction from fascism, you know, that uh, it wasn't that, uh, that he was imposing some all power super state on American society. Uh, it's that he was criminally negligent in response to, uh, to the COVID crisis that that sort of like, like, you know, fascism, <laughs> You know, to its to its credit, right? Fascism is all about this sort of total mobilization of society for you know external, you know, object. Generally speaking, making aggressive war on other people. Uh, you know, but we could have used some of that total mobilization in response to COVID, and we didn't get it. You know, what we got, you know, what we got was was uh, was Trump um, lying and saying it wasn't that bad, and undermining you know health experts, and you know, and 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 again, it wasn't you know. Like an actual fascist, I think, would have used COVID, you know, like that kind of unprecedented crisis as an excuse to claim a whole bunch of new powers for himself, uh, mm-hmm. you know, and, you know, and say, oh, this is an emergency. You know, let me gobble up all the power that I can. Trump did the opposite. He just sat on his hands and did nothing. Sure. Yeah, no, I mean, all very well said. I think uh, I think you've you pretty much convinced me uh, in that uh, that he's harmful in a lot of the same ways that you know basically just through you know tax breaks for the rich and uh deregulation or uh what is it dismantling the uh yeah deconstructed the administrative state that was the yeah. steve bannon thing uh-huh. <laughs> um you know that uh weird euphemism um which- yeah which, which 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 is perfect by the way i love that because bannon <laughs> says that and that sounds like vaguely creepy it also sounds in a weird way, like something that like a graduate student who'd just been reading a lot of Foucault would say, but like, what does that actually mean? As far as I can tell, it just means deregulation, you know, like that, that's, that's just, I, I, I mean, like, I, I think that people like Bannon to a very great extent are just Reaganites who've, who've sort of embraced this kind of sinister branding in, in a way that's almost like, you know, uh, I don't know, like Ozzy Osbourne, you know, uh, uh, you know, touring as, you know, uh, you know, with this like Prince of Darkness persona or something, you know, it's, it's, it's not uh, like, you know, you might, you know, you might bite the head off the occasional bat, but you're not actually, uh, you know, like, like you're basically like any, you know, like you're basically just a musician, you know, you're not actually anything special. You know, I, I think, I think somebody like Bannon, like he did a, uh, he did this big debate with uh, David from, in Toronto, I want to say 2019, uh, and uh, and you know, and David Frum is a never Trump Republican, and the, and you know, the entire debate was just um, Frum sort of throwing rhetoric at Bannon to insinuate that he's a fascist, and Bannon throwing rhetoric at you know Frum to you know that was like vaguely populist about you know working class deplorables and stuff like that. But like my big impression at the end of it was they never really got into any policy you know because probably because they don't really disagree that much they're but they're both republicans they most they mostly want the same things sure yeah i mean like the most lasting damage that you know i don't obviously don't know every detail of all the shitty things that trump did but um you know the fact that uh my girlfriend was like interning with the you know department of education last a couple summers ago and you know And she's, you know, worked with some people uh, who, you know, do like environmental law and stuff like that. And, you know, I think something that was completely undersung is that I I never really heard that many people talking about was like how he was just he was dismantling all these government agencies. And like, you know, the I think I something like the EPA office in Atlanta um, had like an entire like two floors of it where, you know, all the people got let go because they you know cut the funding to it or whatever um and you know just lots of stuff like that that's like did he do it any differently from how you know reagan or mitt romney or somebody would have done it i mean no i don't think so i mean like like he he did like he was very um yeah i mean i think the lasting damage absolutely the sort of downsizing of those federal departments including by the way getting rid of the office that was supposed to uh prepare for you know for uh for pandemics yeah, oops. Uh, and um, and I think that was a huge part of the damage. I think appointing, um, 
you know, conservative uh, Supreme Court justices, you know, so, so, uh, you know, making, you know, very hard to imagine the, uh, you know, short of some sort of court packing that even if they had the votes in the Senate, I have a very hard time imagining the Democrats doing. It's very hard to imagine that flipping back anytime soon. So that's definitely a lasting damage. Um, I, I think, you know, in, in fact, there was an article in the New York Times in the last weeks of the Trump administration, uh, there was a, um, you know, there was there was a rush by by you know Trump officials to uh, to undo a lot of like labor and safety regulations, like uh, for example, uh, you know that that limited like uh, the uh, driving hours of you know long distance truck drivers. You know, like 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 they, like all of this stuff is 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 completely despicable. Uh, and and again, I mean, I do think that there are differences that matter even between you know terrible neoliberal Democrats and, uh, uh, and, and the, the Trumps and, and Romneys of the world. But, but I, I do think that that's the right categorization scheme. You know, it's the, uh, you know, I, I mean, Trump was a particularly, you know, vile and clownish, you know, face of it, you know, but I, I, I think that they, but I think, yeah, I think he was basically, I mean, in terms of the way he governed, you know, I mean, like he, there were a couple of, um, of sort of, you know, there were co- like, like, I think some of the immigration stuff he did, uh, you know, like he was particularly, uh, he was particularly harsh and, and, and cruel about, you know, as, as a, uh, as a kind of sop to the most demented part of his base, uh, you know, but, um, but I think if you, if you take that out of the, the equation, uh, and and it, that's also interesting in terms of the of his relative weakness as a president, you know, because he uh, as as cruel as a lot of what he did was, you know, family separation, you know, the attempts at some version of a Muslim ban, you know, all that stuff. Uh, he the actual immigration numbers, you know, were um, uh, I think actually low. You know, it's a little. I'm not a hundred percent sure if you're looking at the same, you know, but I think if you're looking at the same time frame, you know, Obama's first term versus Trump. You know, I think the actual deportation numbers were a little lower, you know, on, under Trump, uh, which I don't think he gets any credit for that. I think he tried his best, you know, uh, to uh, to deport lots of people. And I think a lot of the credit for that goes to, like, uh, you know, state and local activists who've been, you know, pushing for years to do things like uh, sanctuary city initiatives, you know, uh, to, to get the local police department to not cooperate with ICE. Uh, but it, it's but it's still again it's it's still remarkable that he didn't really remake uh you know american institutions and his own authoritarian image you know he just did a lot of the things that you know there was a little bit of extra racist stuff but mostly he did all the things that that any uh, republican president would do he deregulated he appointed conservative judges uh and and really i guess also you know on this fascism point specifically like if you're you know if you're arguing it like talk about the immigration stuff uh i think that one thing that i worry about you know with as far as like the politics the fascism analogy is that it tends to be about positioning trump as this new radical different break from what's what's happened what's come before uh and i think that that gets like the thing that's the most fascisty you know in in the last four years has been ice you know and and uh and and everything it's done and you know and and everything trump tried to do to 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 really let them off the leash and you know do do raids in places they hadn't done raids before and you know separate you you know uh you know separate families and all this stuff but like i guess what i i you know what i i think is a little disturbing about the whole emphasis on trump as a fascist is that it, it kind of lets the the larger fascisty thing uh, about this institution, you know, I uh, ice off the hook a little bit, you know, like this is, this is an inst- like ice was created by George W. Bush. It was expanded under Obama. It is, you know, not going anywhere, you know, under, uh, under Biden. And I, th- I think that's what we should be like. I, th- I think I worry that that positioning Trump as this like special different thing, that's not, you know, oh, he's not just a regular Republican, he's a fascist, I, I think kind of takes our eye off the ball about the, like, maybe institutional things that most deserve to be analogized to fascism. 
Yeah, no, I think that's an excellent point, actually. Um, hadn't really quite looked at it that way, but yeah, it is sort of, you know, as I was kind of saying uh, when I was first asking about this, like, you know, uh, it's only, well, you know, uh, Noam Chomsky recently, which I think I commented something on a tweet of yours recently, but I, I, I was gratified to hear him say uh, some, I think it was the question of is Trump a fascist, something like that. And he was like, I mean, it's a terminological question, you know, <laughs> and I don't think I had ever heard that uh, word before terminological or phrase ter terminological question. But um, I kind of, you know, as a just, you know, side note, somebody who yeah. likes language, I, I like that term both because I, I'm pretty sure what it means is that it's just a question of terminology. But then it also kind of has the sound. It hits my ear with this like it's like interminable, like there's no way to ever actually like have a concrete answer to the question. Um, and uh, so, you know, but Allah like is a, um, is a hot dog, a, a hamburger or a, is a hot dog, a sandwich and, you know, that kind of thing, which, you know, that's sort of those, I don't know, Seinfeldy kind of conversations, I guess. <laughs> those can be sort of fun to have, but like my take on those is always just like, winds up being like, that's just not how, language like you know the 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 test is like if you were to go to a restaurant and ask for a you know cylindrical meat sandwich and <laughs> they, they don't know what you're talking about then no a hot dog's not a sandwich <laughs> like it's language is just for communicating ideas effectively and um you know yeah right like like uh like derek parfit is an academic philosopher who has a uh, paper called the unimportance of identity uh where he he kind of sets forward this this um you know this principle i think he calls it like the argument from below where he says that basically arguments about um arguments about how to apply terms are only important if if the underlying thing that would merit the application of the term is important right like the uh right. so um you know if like so he has this example about two different circumstances under which somebody might ask the question, am I going to be in pain? So one of them is somebody who um, is about to go on a ship and whenever they go on a ship, they get seasick. They know hundred percent for sure. That's what's going to happen to them. Uh, and they're, they're curious in this is a hot dog, a sandwich kind of way about whether uh, seasickness counts as a kind of pain, you know, whatever it is, nausea, pain. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the other one is somebody who's about to go into surgery and they're not sure how well the anesthetic is going to work, right? You know, the, uh, the second one is important to the way that the first one isn't. And so I, I think we could say something maybe similar, you know, something, you know, kind of applying Derek Parfit's point to, uh, to the fascism question that if what well, I think very often this is like a proxy for other kinds of, of debates that are, that are more, um, more important in exactly the same way. And so I, I think oftentimes whatever value there is to engaging in it, which, which I have a little bit, you know, I, I wrote a article with Daniel Bester on this, on this question. It's called like uh, Trump is a threat to democracy, but that doesn't mean he's winning. Uh, oh, I think I read that one actually. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think that the value of this is that at least trying to sort out the senses in which he could or couldn't be a fascist at least gets you at those more important underlying questions like is Trump uh, a, you know, is Trump like a deviation from normal American politics or or just maybe a really particularly crass expression of, of it or is Trump a, you know, a threat to or was Trump a threat to uh you know, to basic democratic institutions or are those institutions such as they are just fine? And, and the question we should really worry about is how to make them, you know, more democratic uh, or, you know, et cetera. We could ask a bunch of questions like this, but I think those are the more important questions. And I see this all the time in the other direction. Like people will, you know, will, when they're arguing about like people on the left might argue about like whether the Soviet Union, you know, that kind of society counted as a form of socialism or oh, they'll yeah. argue about like whether, um, you know, some proposed scheme for how a post-capitalist economy could work would count as a form of socialism. And and I, I used to always just sort of engage with this in a really straightforward way. It's like, like no, 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 it, it wasn't or this would be or whatever, you know, uh, mm. at and I, I think that's defensible. You can you can make those arguments in a way that's 
like, okay, you could say this is how historically it's been used, whatever. But I think that very often now I'm more inclined to kind of uh, pull that same Parfit Chomsky kind of move and say, well, whether we want to use this label socialism to describe something is the least interesting question we can probably ask about it, right? The, quite, the question you should ask about the Soviet Union is not like, is it so was it a form of socialism but like was that a desirable model for 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 how you know we want societies to work after capitalism you know like that's that's really i think the question that's kind of lurking behind the the terminological debate anyway and so i think it's it's quite often better to just jump to that yeah no absolutely and um you know i i i also uh side note or you know i won't yeah. spend time on this but like the um the, i noticed that in your article you you put the word coup in uh quotation marks yeah, and yeah. it's like i think it's, there's a similar thing with that where it's like well i mean the definition of a coup i mean i didn't actually look up the merriam webster definition of it yeah, but yeah. it's like it's trying to install a head of state who wasn't democratically elected seems like that's kind of the definition okay i mean and, and, if, and if that's what you mean by coup uh then uh and there's no requirement in there about um about whether it any, ha, ever had any chance of success yeah then <laughs> then sure you can call it an attempted coup um I, I think although also note that if that's what it means then uh bush v gore in 2000 was a successful coup Right. You know, that's because oh. that actually did install somebody who lost the Democratic election. Um, you know, I, I would also say that I think oftentimes with with terms that are are important and controversial, just kind of like, I don't know. I mean, like, I'll, I'll tell people this in, in classes when, you know, and I, I, you know, I mean, I generally not that we're talking about this stuff because I generally feel some weird sense of obligation to, you know, leave my own politics at the door, you know, uh, of the, uh, of, of the classroom. Although obviously now everybody has Google. So, you know, uh, you know, it's, it's not like people don't know what I think, but um, you know, but like when people are writing, you know, philosophy papers and they'll start with, you know, Miriam Webster says, you know, free will means blah, blah, blah. Like I'll be like, you know, these things are incredibly difficult questions you know you, you're gonna have these giant philosophical debates about how to think about some concept like this uh trust me just because you work for miriam webster doesn't mean you have any special insight you know about sure. that that you know that everybody else everybody else lacks so i'd say that like i'm sure i'm sure that on like you know like it could very well be true that that like that it that just sort of you know applying the miriam webster you know category like definition you know probably um January 6th was, you know, an attempted coup. I would argue that if we're trying to capture more accurately uh, what I think most of us mean by that term, most times we use it uh, and, and more carefully, I, I do think that there is a, um, you know, I think that whether, okay, so if you believe that somebody won a democratic election, but you're wrong and you're trying to pressure Congress, you know, to, to, to not certify the result of what you think is a stolen election. Is that a coup? You know, like, mm. like, I, I think that's a little bit gray area anyway. And then I think, especially in, in this case, um, I think the big thing that's lacking, what we usually mean when we talk about a, a, an attempted coup, I think there's a, there's an implication there of um, like, I think when we say attempted coup, I think what we usually mean is, is, as an attempt by the kinds of forces that might actually be able to pull it off, you sure. know, because, because if you, if you don't have that, right. Then, uh, and tempted to are really, really common. Like, like, they, like they happen all the time. Like, like if, if I, if, if like the weather underground issues a, um, you know, in 1970, whatever, whenever the weather underground started, uh, or 1969, maybe anyway, uh, if the weather underground issues like a declaration of revolutionary war against the United States government and, you know, sets off a couple of bombs and, uh, you know, the uh, bathrooms of government buildings or whatever, it, you know, is that a coup attempt? I mean, their, their stated goal is to topple the U.S. government, but, you know, it ain't going to happen. And so I, I think it's, I'm not, uh, again, I, I think that if, 
if what we're arguing about is just how to use the word, then see above, right? If mm -hmm. what we're, but if I think the more serious thing is that when people like insist on using that language, that it's an attempted coup, I think that the question is like, should we think of this as being in the same category in terms of how we respond to it, how we think about it as like a real no shit attempted coup, like, you know, Venezuela 2002, where, uh, you know, the, the military, um, you know, arrests, uh, you know, uh, the key figures of the elected government and there's a new government that's declared and they, 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 I, on the big, you know, main TV channels, you know, they issue their communique or whatever, mm -hmm. but then in the coming days, they don't pull it off and, you know, people manage to, to push back and they fill the streets or whatever. And, and, and the coup plotters give up. Like to me, that's an attempted coup, right? This is 800 QAnon lunatics um, who, uh, who have a view of the world that's, that's completely detached from reality. Uh, some of whom are dangerous and violent, no doubt about it, right? You know, but uh, but you know, some of whom are are just like you know, they're 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 just store like they're um, you know they're engaged in what I think we would normally just think of as a militant protest tactic, and it's a militant protest tactic with uh, an evil purpose in this case to undermine a democratic election, uh, although. It's if we're not talking about people who did anything violent, we're just talking about people who streamed into the Capitol and, you know, walked around waving flags and chanting slogans. It's the same militant protest tactic that was used in like Wisconsin in 2011 that I was all for when people were trying to, in that case, they weren't trying to pressure an elected legislature into not certifying the results of a democratic election. They were trying to pressure it into not passing this this law that would eliminate public you know collective bargaining rights for public employees in wisconsin uh you know but it, i don't think um i mean i think that it was it was a protest that in many ways turned into a riot it was a mixture for protest and a riot which is not an uncommon thing right i think that there are plenty sure. of examples of protests and causes that both of us support that you could say the same thing about uh without you know, without uh, beating this particular dead horse too much. I think some of those examples are pretty recent. Uh, and, mm. you know, all of which is, is just to say, not that they're morally equivalent. They're not, right? I mean, people who, you know, people who are engaged in protests or riots or half protests, half riots for the purposes of opposing, you know, systemic racism and police brutality, um, you know, we could argue about the tactics, but I mean, that's basically, that's a fundamentally good thing. And people who are doing the same stuff because they're, um, you know, they're, they're trying to, to overturn a democratic election and they believe this, this, this cultist, uh, you know, a psychotic view that, uh, you know, all of the all of the democratic politicians are part of a satanic cabal of of pedophile cannibals, and you know, whatever. Like, like there's there's certainly no moral equivalence between those two things. But but I think the thing that is that is important to me is that we keep track of what the biggest threat is. And so, I mean, I could make my terminological argument about why I don't think that calling that a coup really tracks what we normally mean by coup. But I think the more important thing is being inflating the threat level, right. To, to mm. the point where you're willing to support things that could be used or, you know, if they had been in place last summer would have been used to crack sure. down in a much harder way on, on things that, that you would support. It's like, uh, I always liked, um, you know, and I mean, this is, you know, is, I mean, Glenn Greenwald is, is a, um, you know, is a complicated figure and he's got some takes I like, and he's got some takes I don't like, you know, but he has, uh, but I've always loved uh, his, um, his line. I remember from, you know, uh, I don't know, it was like something he wrote in like 2009 or something, you know, he had this great line about how 
Uh, you know, we managed to keep all these constitutional protections all through World War II and Soviet intercontinental ballistic missiles you know, being pointed at the U.S. all the time. But, you know, this 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 tiny group of cave dwelling fanatics who try to blow up an airplane or a nightclub every five years for them. You know, we have to, uh, you know, basically get rid of the Fourth Amendment, you know, all this stuff. And and I, I think something's very similar here. Right. You know, like for, a, you know, we, we don't need to start setting, pre- you know, we don't need to inflate 800 QAnon lunatics uh, storming the Capitol uh, to, you know, to the point of thinking of it as this like existential threat to the existence of our, you know, not super democratic democracy. Uh, And I I worry that inflating it to that level of, and really exaggerating that threat in the same way, you know, that, that, the same way that we don't need to get rid of the Fourth Amendment, you know, for the sake of protecting ourselves against Al Qaeda, uh, I think that to protect ourselves against, you know, QAnon, you know, we don't need to start setting these crazy precedents that, you know, that would uh, that we were talking about earlier, you know, that people have been suggested, and or like uh, Eliza Slotkin, you know, who's my, um, well, I guess where I'm living now, she's not my congresswoman, but she, uh, but like where I grew up, you know, where my parents live, you know, she's the congresswoman representing them. You know, and and she's made all these comments about how we need like a new, you know, a new war on terror, basically, you know, against domestic extremism, you know, and and I, and so my bigger, you know, I mean, I do think, I do think that it's a more, I th- I do think it's a better reflection of how we normally use words to say that January six didn't rise to the level of an attempted coup. Mm-hmm. But on the more important underlying mm-hmm. question, right? Not like, do we use this word coup to describe it or not? Uh, my worry is that people who are really insistent about that language oftentimes see it as this existential you know, threat to the existence of American democracy, which I would really push back against both because I don't think it was and because I'm worried that that's like talking ourselves into that is kind of how we talk ourselves into this big expansion of the the national security state and, and the carceral state that would be bad for everybody. Sure. Yeah, no, that's excellent points. I mean, I think, uh, you know, the, the day after that, I, uh, you know, on January 7th, I remember hearing uh, a lot of people referring to in the, you know, kind of more liberal, like NPR media, ref- referring to the people who stormed the Capitol as insurrectionists. My yeah. initial reaction to that was insurrectionist just sounds too fucking badass for you know like what they were like that kind of raises it to this like grand kind of level that i don't know if it really needs to be and i feel like you know they giving them a, a cool title like that is not really like you know helpful um and yeah, i just don't think yeah, they deserve it <laughs> yeah i think so right and, and i mean i think that one's a little funny too because like with coup we could have this whole arg- like that's like a commonly used political term so we could sure. have this whole argument about how we how we normally use it and whether it really applies um insurrection is kind of a funny one because i mean that's like that's like such a weird archaic term you know like you don't uh i i think you could you know, up until January 6th, you could have watched 10,000 hours of CNN and never once seen anybody use that word sure. to describe anything. Right. So, mm-hmm. so, so it's, it's a little, I, I think my, you know, linguistic intuitions are a little less clear there, you know, about whether this, this mm-hmm. counts as a, insur- you know, what does, our, what does insurrection mean? You know, and uh, I guess when I think of an insurrection, you know, I, I think about like, um, I mean, times that I'll use it, you know, would be to think about like actual, like the seizing of power and like some like revolution, you know, like, like, like maybe, um, you know, October, 1917, you know, was, was a insurrection, you know, that uh, they get you a know, storm in the winter palace or whatever. Uh, but I, I don't know. I mean, maybe it is, you know, maybe it does fit, you know, I think you could, you, I'm sure you could make a, you know, a linguistic case for that, but yeah, I have the same worry that you do. Like, I think especially, I mean, if it was just kind of an idle question, it's like, oh, hey, does that count as an insurrection? Like, yeah, I guess, right? You know, like, mm-hmm. the, uh, uh, but then the way that that term has just been obsessively used in centrist and 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 kind of progressive light media mm-hmm. uh, since January 6th is very off-putting to me for exactly the reason that you're saying, you know, that it's, it's like, 
like the way that it's just kind of become this this event that's like the capital t capital t capital i the insurrection you know like 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 the way that the the terrorist attacks on september 11th just became the, the numbers you know 9 11 mm-hmm. you know it's like this is the insurrection and yeah that really elevates these guys to a to le- to a level that uh that yeah I, I think you're right they don't really deserve it's like uh it's like the way you know again going back to 9 11 and al-qaeda you know it's like when when people you know i i remember thinking back then you know that this is like you know above and beyond everything else that's wrong with it using all this terminology of like war to describe this is really like giving more credit than we should i think to to some of these people's delusions right you know sure like, yeah somebody who hijacks an airplane or something might think of themselves as a soldier engaged in a war but it's like yeah come on no you're not that like you're just this like petty criminal who who can be who could be handled just fine by the regular criminal justice system. Sure. Yeah. I mean, and that's what like, you know, isn't that kind of the, the point of terrorism is to like, you know, with relatively like little resources and, you know, a few people to be able to like get this outsized reaction from your opponent, which I think is, you know, essentially what we did after nine 11, you know, was like, yeah, uh, you know, we we completely overreacted to something that was just, you know, a very visible, um, you know, something that didn't pose enough of a threat, I think, to justify, obviously, you know, so much of the stuff that we did in reaction to it. Um, yeah. But uh, and I guess, you know, we've been going for like about an hour now. So yeah. I'll, um, uh, I you know, I had the, the nationalizing Walmart and uh, talking about like some more kind of uh, leftist infighting stuff. Maybe I can have you on again sometime a little bit well, sooner. Look, look, you, want, you want to do, uh, you know, you want to do like five minutes of nationalizing Walmart and we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll save the leftist infighting for next time. Uh, sure. Well, actually I did have one um, sure. uh, question that just came to mind. Uh, the that's kind of along the lines of yeah. what, what we've been talking about. Um, you know, uh, Eugene Debs was uh, in, you know, he was convicted of sedition, right? Wasn't yeah. that what he was yep. charged with? Yep. That's another word that I heard that that was making. Yeah, me yeah. Really I see nervous. sedition all the time. It's sedition and insurrection, which is funny in both cases because, like, they're really reaching back to these terms that have that like 19th century, you know, feel to them. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm not sure why that is, but it's 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 very. Yeah, like like sedition, right? You 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 immediately. I mean, if you know your left history, yeah, you should think of World War One. You know, people like Debs being, you know, being tried under the uh, was it the uh, Alien and Sedition Act, or uh, I might mm-hmm. be getting my wires crossed, but there are, there are a couple of these these laws. It's, uh, it's that, like uh, one of them was, I think, like uh, I did. I'm I'm like reaching way way back i think i did a report on the alien and sedition acts like in high school um but from what i remember it's something like you know they they passed them during world war one and then like immediately it was kind of or within like three years it was kind of like seeing that oh shit these are being like applied to basically just infringe on people's like freedom of speech to like criticize the government and you know or criticize like the world war one in that case and you know it's like I feel like we should be careful. You know, the whole thing about, you know, censoring, um, you know, kicking Nazis off of YouTube or whatever, they're going to use that same yeah. you know, mechanism to come after the left. I do think that that's like a legitimate point of concern. Yeah, right. I, I mean, like, like, like in some ways, like when I was talking to uh, Natalie Wynn about this, you know, we were, we were talking about how bizarre this is that there are people on the radical left uh, who both, advocate uh insurrection uh as a way of of achieving socialism and also think that that like youtube and the social media platforms you know are being too permissive about what people can say on there and and they always it always just strikes me as guys right you know like uh the only way that i could see that anybody could hold both of those thoughts in their head at the same time is if they just assume that they're not a big enough threat to uh, the status quo for anybody to bother censoring them, which, you know, might be true, but that's incredibly sad you know, <laughs> if, uh, you know, if, if it is true that, you know, that, and, and that's always the, um, yeah, that's always the question. Like, I'm not, I don't necessarily think that, you know, it should just be, you know, YouTube 
uh, that there's no such thing as going in the direction of just letting it be a bathroom stall, you know, that you can, you can just scroll anything on like that. They, there are, uh, I mean, certainly if you're like threatening somebody or whatever, you know, like, 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 like I'm sure we could come up with cases where we would agree that a reasonable set of rules, you know, might lead to somebody being kicked off. Uh, but I mean, if you, if you hold out hope <laughs> that the left could in the future, uh, you know, be, be a significant threat to capital, uh, then you should really, really worry about not having those rules air pretty hard in the direction of free speech. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the, you know, sedition could is defined, like when I heard that word a lot, I, I did look it up to see like, you know, there's several different definitions, but I, you know, one of the ones I saw was something like just uh, advocating for a different form of government. So like, <laughs> yeah. I don't know if I really want to be like throwing that term around right now, but um, yeah, right. And, and it's, yeah. Uh, that certainly the history of of um, of laws against uh, against sedition is is very uh, very bad for us, right? Like or like the Smith Act, which is uh, which is what was used uh, to uh, to justify a lot of the like post World War II you know prosecutions of um, of communists. Uh, you know, was was uh, I believe um, yeah, I think that I think was like something that actually the um you know the american communist party initially was all for it you know because 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 they were they thought it, you know it's gonna be used to you know prosecute nazis uh mm -hmm. and and so again I, th I think there's a uh you know i think that cautionary tales just abound you know in in the history sure. of this stuff you know like like one um you know one that i'd, I'd mention uh that's well, that I mentioned in the nation piece is, you know, Brian Atinsky, you know, is one of the founders of India Media Israel. Uh, and, uh, and, and he told me the story about how after the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin, you know, the Israeli prime minister by a, uh, uh, by a right-wing Jewish terrorist in, uh, in the nineties, um, you know, Israeli liberals pushed for a broader definition of incitement, you know, because, because they, they thought that a lot of the, um, the, the, like Israeli rights rhetoric leading up to the assassination of Rabin, you know, like, like helped create the atmosphere where that, that happened. And then those incitement laws were used against uh, Atinsky and his comrades, at, you know, Indy Media Israel, you know, because like they, they did, you know, they, they published like a cartoon with like Ariel Sharon kissing Hitler or something, you know, like that kind of, mm -hmm. the kind of thing that's, you know, um, you know, they, they sort of, you know, it's very much in the tradition of, of like subversive, you know, political cartoons. Uh, and, you know, that was, uh, uh, and that was considered, you know, to, uh, to, to be incitement. And, and I think one of the big lessons here, of course, you could imagine you say, Oh, well, I'm sure you could draw all kinds of distinctions. Like, Oh, that's not the same. Here's why one's okay. And the other's not fair enough, but, who do you think is actually going to be enforcing any of this stuff, right? Like, <laughs> uh, is it going to be people who who like the left, who have our best interests at heart, you know, or is it going to be uh, people who uh, would love an excuse to, uh, to to crack down on us? And I think that whether we're talking about, you know, corporate tech oligarchs, you know, as in the, as in the YouTube case, or whether we're talking about, like, the Justice Department, uh, I mean, I, I certainly, you know, I, I think there's plenty of evidence that uh, that that given the you know given the chance whatever you know whatever tools are put at their disposal, you know are going to be used against the left. Sure. Yeah. And I mean, you know, maybe we can uh, I guess kind of put a put a bow on things and maybe touch on the nationalizing Walmart thing for just yeah. a second. Uh, the um you know on the on the topic of like big tech censorship and stuff you know one of, the, one of the places that when like some ding dong posts on usually it's on facebook is where i encounter a lot of yeah, yeah. arguments from the right because you know hometown sure, uh, folks um yeah older but, people use facebook uh yes older people and you know people from my hometown which is you know sure, sure. the northeast georgia mountains but um you know uh the, a lot of times these those arguments will just devolve into or end up at um so 
do you think that we should nationalize Wal- or na- nationalize uh, these social media companies then, yeah. or, or YouTube yep. or whatever? And it's like, you know, when they're saying like, oh, this is they're um, infringing on First Amendment rights. It's like, well, you know, it, it kind of goes back to the thing about like uh, wanting, you know, the death penalty for cops who kill people or whatever. It's yeah, like, yeah. OK, as a leftist, you know, like I think that the, you know, the private corporations um you know the first amendment does not apply to private corporations right, and right. but i don't want them to be private corporations <laughs> or like, yeah, yeah, yeah no ex- exist, exactly so. like, like, like the first amendment doesn't apply to private corporations and that is a good reason to think it's not a good idea to have companies that have a massive amount of control over the flow of information be private uh, because, mm-hmm. cause this is a, this is a common good, you know, this is something that it's, it's, uh, it's, you know, essentially in its function, you know, it's a, it's a digital commons, you know, and, and, but, uh, unfortunately it's one that's, that's a, it's a pre-enclosed commons, you know, it's one that's, that's, uh, that is owned, you know, by, by private companies. And, and that's just a bad, um, it's just a bad combination. You know, I, I want, um, I mean, I, I think in the, um, you know, in the case of Walmart, you know, my, my argument in that, that article for, for nationalizing them uh, is that it's something that, uh, you know, Walmart as a private entity, as it currently exists, is incredibly destructive in tons of ways that I'm sure for anybody who, who, um, who listens to your show, you know, we probably don't even need to, to rattle off. I'm sure people are familiar, but what's the solution do we just want there not to be you know like 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 ideally what would we want right would we want like every walmart store in the u.s to close i don't think so because for one thing that's uh it's it's one of the biggest employers in the country you know that's that's a lot of lost jobs for another thing uh it's a it's a source of of relatively low-cost consumer goods that tons of people rely on uh so what i'd like instead is uh, is for it to continue to exist, but in a way where it wouldn't have some of those same profit incentives to do the terrible things that that it does, uh, you know, to to workers, to the environment, and etc. And I think that uh, if we look at like the U.S. Postal Service, you know, I, I think that's the kind of example that uh, that gives me confidence that we could have a organization on the scale of Walmart that uh, continued to. Um, you know, to provide, uh, you know, very low cost services, uh, but, you know, could still, you know, pay people a living wage and, you know, and all of that stuff, you know, the way that the post office does. Uh, and so I think somewhat similarly in, in, in the YouTube case, you know, I'd say, well, it's, it's something that we need, right? You know, we, we, we want to have, we don't want to regress to living in a society where people uh, don't have a way to, to you know, post videos in a central location where very easily everybody else in the world knows where to go to access them and all that, mm-hmm. right? That that's a really useful service to have. Uh, but precisely because it is so useful, uh, it's, it's a really bad and dangerous thing that decisions about what you can and can't have, you know, put in that digital commons are made by like, you know, this, this one corporation, you know, that, that, uh, that controls that, or even if we broaden it out to talk about YouTube and Twitter and whatever, you know, that's, it's still like, you know, this tiny number of CEOs are making these decisions. Uh, and I'd like those things to be a matter of public policy, you know, that, that everybody has some, you know, it's like, uh, Michael Walter's line about socialism, you know, what touches all should be decided by all. Uh, and, you know, and I'd also like, yeah, I also like the idea of those constitutional speech protections uh, being extended to them, you know, like, mm-hmm. like the same way that like when, um, you know, when um, like Ronald Reagan was the governor of California, you know, he, he tried to get the University of California to uh, fire Angela Davis uh, for, uh, for being a communist. And, uh, and he was, unable to do so because the courts ruled that no, you know, it's a public university. So she's a public employee. So you can't fire her just for having political, you know, views that you don't like. Uh, whereas, and, you know, I mean, there are, I think some state laws in a few States that, that impose some restrictions on this, but, you know, for the most part, like if, uh, you know, private employers, you know, want to 
want to fire you, they can just fire you. You know, like they they can, you know, there are there are you know, there are limits in certain areas, you know, you, they, you can't, you know, you can't discriminate against somebody in employment for, you know, for, for their race or gender, you know, but you can, uh, but you can certainly discriminate against them for their views. Uh, that's no problem at all. That's why doxing is something that's such a potent, you know, threat, you know, to, uh, to use against people, or at least a big part of the reason why, you know, is, is because private employers can pretty much, if they just get embarrassed by, you know, the views that somebody has been expressed and they don't want to associate with them, they can, they can pretty much, you know, just, just fire them, uh, you know, unless there's like a union or, you know, something else that might give them some level of protection, uh, so I, I think similarly with, yeah, we, I absolutely want to nationalize, you know, YouTube and, and, and the other, you know, the other big tech companies, um, you know, that I, I also think that I guess the last thing I'd say about that is that one, I think there's also an argument for, for nationalizing them just on the same grounds that you have like state monopolies and lots of places on like gambling, you know, that, that, you know, um, you know, that you can have, you know, you can have a lot of, you know, you can have a state lottery, you know, but you can't have, you know, whatever, you know, just like, you know, bookies are still legal or whatever. And I'm not saying that's even necessarily the right approach to gambling or it isn't, it's a complicated issue, but that same sort of impulse that like, uh, or the way that there are, um, you know, that the, that we have more state regulation on, on any, on like different substances that are addictive, you know, that, uh, that uh, like social media is, is very much an addictive product and very intentionally an addictive product. And, and so um, having that in the hands of profit seeking corporations, you know, I think is kind of bad news, you know, that like we can, I'd like to be able to make, collective democratic decisions about like how we want, you know, Twitter and all these to work uh, mm -hmm. rather than putting it in the hands of CEOs and boards of directors whose only responsibility is to shareholders, uh, you know, and, and to maximizing profits for those shareholders. And, you know, the more, you know, the more minutes every day, everybody's, you know, everybody's eyes are glued to their product, the better, you know, the better that is. And, I'm not sure that that's great for, you know, society in general. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, uh, one of the pieces of, um, of pushback I got, you know, when I posted your, uh, your video on, uh, the, that was a Jacobin video, right? The nationalized Walmart thing. Yeah, that's right. Um, yep. And, uh, you know, when I posted it to, I posted it, I think to the socialism versus capitalism subreddit and, you know, got a lot of predictable pushback sure. from right wingers. Um, but, one of the things that I, I saw people saying was like, should we, uh, or, you know, from, from leftists presumably yeah. saying like, well, uh, I think instead of nationalizing it, we should turn it into a worker owned co-op and, you know, without, uh, being able to like put words in your mouth, I figured yeah, yeah. Like, knowing what I know about, uh, Ben's uh. political philosophy, that's, probably kind of what he means by that um just to like extend sure. democracy to you know just make it sure. more democratic yeah i think that in the in the walmart case um i mean I'm, I'm i'm friendly to that i mean i think that the so so i i would think of like nationalization as one specific form of socialization you know saying that you, you, instead of something being controlled by like you know, being owned by, you know, shareholders or, uh, or, or sole proprietors or whatever, uh, that, that it should be owned by, you know, the workers or the larger communities or some combination of the two. And, uh, but, you know, but we shouldn't have that, that division, you know, of, I mean, this is ultimately what I'd like in society in general as a socialist, that I don't want to have a society be divided, you know, between a class of workers and a class of owners, you know, and, and, mm. and so I want some sort of social ownership. Uh, what form should that take in any given case? You know, I think there are different considerations that, that could be brought up for, for different kinds of things. Um, like, I think in some cases there are good reasons to want nationalization to really take the form, like socialization to really take the form of nationalization. Like, like I don't want... Um, like, I wouldn't want, like, to have, like, worker cooperative health insurance companies, for example. Uh because they would still have, uh, you know, because they would still have the same terrible, you know, incentives. incentives. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. No, that, 
Exactly right. Sense. So I think I think is Walmart in that category? I don't know. I I think uh, I I could see a case either way. Uh, I mean I I I'd also say that I think that if we were in a position where there was some like radical socialist government that was in power that was actually like it you know started to implement you know these suggestions, mm. uh, I, I'm sure whatever we ended up with would be some sort of messy combination of lots of things that we could just come up with. You know, like, like, like just, just kind of sitting around, you know, uh, speculating about it because, you know, what somebody suggests in like an article like this is going to be some very clean, you know, it's like, here's exactly what we should do. Uh, and, and I think that real history is just messier than that. Um, I mean, I, I think that having, even if the right, even if the right answer in the Walmart case was to have some form of state ownership, I'd still like that to be combined with, with, um, you know, with, with some level of democracy at the workplace level, mm. uh, you know, for, for sure. Right. You know, I mean, I don't really get into that in the article or in the, you know, the video that I did based on the article. Um, but that's also because the purpose of the article and the video weren't really to sort of, um, you know, sit around with, with socialists, you know, with other people who are convinced socialists, you know, trying to think about how this stuff would work. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the purpose it was to, uh, was, was to try to appeal to people who, who aren't necessarily, you know, uh, committed socialists who are just like, you know, progressives who don't like Walmart, but aren't sure what to do about it. Uh, and, and for those people, I mean, what I'm really trying to do is to, is to, you know, I don't want to like, I don't want to limit anybody's imagination to not take that extra step to say, okay, but this shouldn't just be like a regular public enterprise. We should, you know, combine this with some form of worker control. Yeah, great. I'm all for it. Right. You know, the, mm -hmm. the purpose is the opposite. It's to try to pry open their imaginations and, and to try to like, see how we could do things that would be well outside of the limits of, of the kind of normal, the normal spectrum of economic debate. And it would be fine. It wouldn't lead to disaster. We wouldn't have mm -hmm. like, it wouldn't be like Soviet grocery stores where, you know, you, you had to hope that the products that you want would be on the shelf or whatever, you know, that like, that's more the case that I'm trying to make. I mean, if somebody wants to say, and we shouldn't stop here, there, we should also do this other thing, you know, that's, that's even more of a radical step than, than I'm, I'm probably going to agree with them. Sure. Yeah, no, I mean, I, uh, uh like the, the whole idea of nationalizing things um, sounds very scary, especially to, you know, to like libertarian minded folks and, and right wingers in general. Um, they, you know, they think of it in a certain way that obviously like we just don't see it unfolding in that same yeah. like they're, you know terrified that it's going to end up with everybody like i would say you know like wearing identical gray jumpsuits and eating like <laughs> yeah. you know, mush paste or whatever um but yeah you know i th i think that it weirdly though when i saw that video one, one of the things that like i was really taken with was um how like even though this seems like a very very left-wing thing to do I still feel like this is kind of something that maybe like Trumpy types could maybe get on board with if you could really like explain it to them, because I think that a lot of the Trump people and some, you know, seeing what a lot of these people's uh, views are and learning more about, you know, people who voted for Trump over the past four years, um, yeah. you know, it seems like they're not really in lockstep with Rush Limbaugh uh, about like free market economics or, you know, name your right wing figure. Yeah, um, yeah. And not in lockstep with them on a lot of different things. And uh, it's just, you know, they identify culturally with these things. And um, yeah, I don't know. I, I think that uh, you're, I, I shared that video on Facebook specifically yeah. whenever I see something that I think will be good for uh, <laughs> right wingers yeah. to maybe they might, you know, entertain the notion. Um, yeah. I mean, I mean, I think, I think it, I think, uh, look, I mean, I'm sure the most hardcore, you know, Trump people, um, you know, probably have imbibed some of the Rush Limbaugh stuff. They'd be horrified by this, but, but I, I, I think the distinction I'd always, I'd always want to make, and I know we're wrapping up, you know, but just to, you know, uh, so I don't want to go off the whole thing about this, but I mean, just uh, real quick, you know, the distinction that I always make is like, who are we talking about here? Right. Are we talking about like the people who are the most hardcore, the most convinced, you know, Trumpites, because what's going to appeal to them? Probably nothing, right? you know, uh, yeah. or is, you know, or whatever. I mean, sometimes people change, but it's unpredictable and, you know, whatever. Uh, or is the question like, what about the 75 million people 
who voted for Trump. Uh, and if they're all unreachable, then we're really in trouble, you know? And, and I don't absolutely. think they are. And, and I think that you're absolutely right to say that I think a lot of those people don't really, haven't really imbibed the Rush Limbaugh free market stuff or not in a very deep way, you know, that they, that like really, if anything, you know, what's, what's motivating a lot of them is, is just kind of a vague sense of cultural grievance. Uh, and, and in some cases they're responding to, um, you know, to very real problems that we, we also think are problems. They've just got terrible solutions to them. Right. Uh, (laughs) Misguided self-interest at play, which I I think when that is the motivating factor, that's like the type of Trump voter and, or, you know, whatever right-wing populist that we really do uh, need to be trying to reach out to more. Yeah. Um, Right. Like, and, and, and I think that having, um, I mean, I think it's, I think this is much more easily said than done. It's like a huge Mm -hmm. task, right? You know, but I think that, uh, I think that if people are convinced that like redistributive economic things could actually happen, you know, if they elect the right people and I think that's a huge hurdle for a lot of people because, because I think without even really thinking about it, they just kind of dismiss that because it, it's sort of anything that sounds like a big change from the way that things are economically, I think just sounds like bullshit to a lot of people. Like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Mm-hmm. That's not going to happen. Uh, sure. But, uh, but I think if you could convince them that was really on the table, uh, you know, that even people who maybe have some, you know, some culturally conservative views that you and I would disagree with, um, you know, like that would at least force them to think about whether they care more about those views or whether they care more about, you know, having more money in their pocket, having, you know, uh, being able to go to the hospital without being charged for it, you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you know, or like if, if the, um, if like taking, you know, you, you mentioned the worker co-op thing earlier, right. If, if that was, if, if the idea that like some like big businesses would be, would be turned into, you know, Mondragon style worker cooperatives, like if, if that, I mean, obviously that's like even beyond the ambition of, of like most like Bernie Kratz, but like if that, you know, but, but if that was something that people really took seriously as was on the table, then it's like, okay, then they have to think about, all right, well, I don't, you know, I've got these culturally conservative views, but man, I like the idea of, uh, of, of not having like an unelected boss who can tell me what to do anymore. You know, then, then, sure. then I think I don't, it's not that every single person would land, in the left-wing direction in that dilemma. But I mean, I'd, I'd like them to have at least have the dilemma. Mm-hmm. Sure. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, you know, like you said earlier, you know, just imagination. I think that a lot of people just their, their imaginations just don't go beyond a certain point. And, you know, once we kind of can explain our ideas to them, a lot of people, you know, that is to, a lot of times that's the reaction I get from people is like, Oh, well, you know, I guess I, I don't think that's all bad when I explain to them, you know, just something uh. like, you know, I mean, I think like corporate control of our government, um, you know, whenever I actually talk to people about like money and politics and stuff like that, it's like everybody seems to agree with me on that. But it's like, so then why the fuck are you a Republican? I don't know. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's a uh, yeah, much, much, much bigger question. We'll have to uh, we'll have to get into that sure, yeah. <laughs> during, during a future appearance. But it is the right question. Well, thank you so much for being so gen- generous with your time, Ben. Um is uh can you uh let the the audience of breadsheet know like where they can find you follow you sure. and what you like to promote sure uh so uh the i am uh, a columnist for jackman so uh that's jackmanmag.com you can you can find everything there uh i am also the host of a um youtube show and podcast called uh, give them an argument so you can just go to YouTube or, you know, any of the places you listen to podcasts and type in, give them an argument and you'll see it. And, um, and then all the other links, I'll just say benburgess.com. That's uh, it's, it's the, the, it, the spelling's a little unusual. It's B-U-R-G-I-S, but that's uh, benburgess.com and you can find everything there. So yeah, thank you for having me. Awesome. Thanks so much for coming on and uh, for your second appearance. And um, I'll let you know when this goes up and would love to have you back again in the future sometime. Perfect. Sounds good. All right. Later. Later. Are you intentionally not being enthusiastic about your songs? Debunk. How can you possibly know that that's right?
right. Give him an argument. Ben Burgess. God is dead. Professor Ben Burgess. Of course. Give him an argument. Watch it for the left. How can you prove that? The prince the best explanation. Karl Marx. Yeah. <laughs> the data is consistent with multiple concept of the philosophy of science. You can't know what's right. How can you possibly know that that's right? Right when economic populism is mostly semi fraud. Ben Burgess, Karl Marx, Ben Burgess, Karl Marx, universal programs that everybody benefits from, You're not an aggression principle. Ben Burgess is a genius. Don't call on my show and act like a fucking libertarian, and I'll, I'll deplatform you in a second. Ben Burgess, thank you for the debunk, my friends. Thank you for all you do. All right, thanks, Michael. All righty, that is going to do it for today's edition of Breadsheet. Thank you to Ben Burgess, who is on Twitter at B-E-N-B-U-R-G-I-S, Ben Burgess. His podcast is Give Them an Argument. He has a book by the same name. Twitter account for that show is at G-T-A-A underscore show. He can be found at YouTube.com slash Ben Burgess G-T-A-A, no underscore on that. And his Patreon is Patreon.com slash Ben Burgess, no underscore on that either. My Patreon, Patreon.com slash Haas underscore Bossman. I'm also on Twitter, Instagram, and Twitch at Haas underscore Bossman. So that's where I am in most places. There's also a Facebook and Tumblr page too, which you can find. Uh, my YouTube channel is Haas Bossman, bit.ly slash Haas Tube, or just go to www.haas.fun for all your Haas needs. And uh, oh, also buy a copy of The Sounds of Breadsheet. That's uh, my the album with uh, the first music from like the first 15 episodes of uh, this podcast that I made. This is all original music on here that I, I make every damn lick of it. Uh, so if you like this music, then uh, do that. Go to uh, Haasbossman dot bandcamp dot com to download the sounds of breadsheet uh, or you can hear my lot not as goofy music that's more a little more focused uh, it's like my quote unquote real music that I write songs about heartache and politics and stuff at uh, the kmax dot bandcamp dot com t h e k m a c k s dot bandcamp dot com all right I love you very very much www.haas.fun. Come back next week for my interview with the great Robbie Martin. Subscribe to Media Roots Radio Podcast to get to know him a little better. Uh, follow him on Twitter at Fluorescent Gray. Oh, wait. I should play you out with something. Uh, I don't know what I'm going to play you out with, but uh, I'm going to find a song, one of my uh, original K-Max songs and play out with that. So uh, brace yourself for a K-Max song that uh, I will choose um, in, a, in a moment. Maybe I'll drop in the uh, robot voice for this. And have some joy as we ride out on the K-Max song, sent boldly, from our 2008 album, Welcome, Everybody, which can be purchased exclusively at thhakemax.bandcamp.com, and also the Bandcamp page can be accessed from www.haas.fun. Love y'all. And, uh, bye. I love you. Flood souls with healing light, etc. Mwah. Yeah.
everything you know You only have this finite chance to grow And broaden your perception Set for all to see Since faith is yielded no results We clearly have no need so bombs away First is the inference that give them an argument. I thought that was something we disagreed on. Debunk. Are you intentionally not being enthusiastic about your songs? Professor Ben Burgess. This is based on data from a bunch of different countries. Give them an argument. Logic for the left. There's abundant evidence that at this point uh, that that's bullshit. Yeah, How can you possibly cool. know that that's Say right? God is dead. Ben Burgess. Yeah, of course. And I made the point that we always make in these discussions, which is the universal rent control coupled with a massive new investment in public housing. Oh, okay. Well, never mind then. How can you prove that? The soundboard here, inference the best explanation. <laughs> inference the best explanation. Concept for the philosophy of science. The data is consistent with multiple explanations. You can't know what's what. Oh. Oh. Totally hypothetical claim. The data is consistent with multiple explanations. Universal health insurance. How do the conservatives feel about it? Give them an argument. Logic for the Len Burgess. Ben what are we debunking this week? Karl Marx universal programs that everybody benefits from not an aggression principle don't call on my show and act like a fucking libertarian <laughs> and I'll, I'll deplatform you in a second give them an argument